Well, thank you, Arpita. Uh, yeah, Lynn and I have been here a long time, but you have to re uh, understand that we got here when we were about 15 years old. Isn't that right, Lynn? <laughs> That's a lie. So, um, <laughs> so we'll come back to that. Uh, so um, Lynn was asked to actually talk about his role in building up uh, energy at Stanford as it now exists. He was kind enough to invite me to help him do that. As usual, being too humble to talk about himself and feeling it might be boring to a bunch of new students to hear a recitation of all his uh, incredible uh, achievements. Uh, he did also remind me, uh, we've been through this a few times, that uh, because we went through some of these wars, I would say I was a um, well-placed observer at times and helped out a little bit along the way. Uh, we, uh, as he put it to the, uh, uh, one of the leaders of the Office of Science at DOE, when she asked me to introduce him, uh, that that was a bad idea because we have a, a, so much dirt on each other we might actually spend the whole time uh, revealing that. But I've been encouraged by Lynn uh, to uh, bring some of that in. So I won't give Lynn's whole uh, uh, bio resume as respect to uh, his role in building up energy at Stanford and as per pre agreement focus on three main things uh, that he uh, helped uh, launch here helped is an understatement as I'll describe. And those are the Global Climate and Energy Project around 2002, uh, the Precord Institute for Energy around 2009, and then not quite Stanford, but related to it and maybe lessons learned here for there, uh, his role as the Undersecretary uh, of Energy for Science and Engineering. This may seem like a you know, bureaucratic acronym, but uh, having been on the applied part of the science advisory board for eight years or something, this chasm between the science, surprisingly maybe to you, uh, the gap between the science side and the applied side, uh, application side of the Department of Energy is some uh, so, uh, uh, pretty wide and Lynn was brought in to uh, uh, do that. So uh, what we're gonna do is after this brief introduction by me, uh, Lynn's gonna make an introductory statement, then we're gonna go through GSAP, pre, uh, PI, and the Under Secretary of Energy role and focus on uh, what were the goals of what was being attempted, again, with Lynn being the where the buck stopped uh, pretty decidedly. Obviously, it took a lot of people to do it, but he was key. Uh, then the Precord Institute for Energy and then DOE um, Under Secretary and then overall lessons learned and hopefully we'll leave 15 or 20 minutes for uh, 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 questions and, uh, and uh, answers. So that's kind of the, uh, the layout of the session. So we're gonna do a little bit of going back and forth. So we'd appreciate if you could keep audience questions till the end and I'll ask some penetrating questions. This is a little bit like the talk show where Lynn is the, uh, you know, Stephen Colbert and I'm one of, his, uh, one of his assistants who's supposed to warm up the audience and keep things light and tell a lot of jokes. Um, and uh, if I say any more about how we've talked about presenting this to you, I will steal Lynn's thunder, because uh, he's really, really good at uh, seeing the student perspective on things. And uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to him for an introductory statement. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, John, uh, I think. Um, <laughs> so um, we, he, he's too modest about his contributions as well. But uh, over the last, uh, gosh, almost 20 years now, we really, we've, we've, we've sort of transformed in a big way uh, how energy research is done here at Stanford. And if there's any, I, I just want to kind of look back at, at some of that and ask what lessons have we learned there that might be helpful to all of us as we try to think about how to meet the challenges that, uh, that uh, uh, Arun and Chris and Rob talked about so uh, effectively the, this morning. I, 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 just to state my overall view, uh, you know, I kind of, I'm, I'm like Rob, I'm, I'm an optimist. I, I think uh, we can do what we need to do. Now that's a different question from will we do it. Uh, there's plenty of challenges there. And, uh, and we should pause and take some satisfaction in the progress we've made so far, wind and solar and you know, battery costs and LEDs are down 95% in cost at just you know, there have been big elements of progress, but of course there are plenty of big challenges that remain. So, so how do we attack all of that? Um, so in the, the uh, early 2000s, um, uh, we, I 
guess uh, if you think about it, it uh, this is this is there's a little bit of a lesson in this. So we were um, in the competition uh, for a something to, for a big uh, carbon mitigation effort. Um, uh, we did not win. Uh, Princeton University won, uh, and there so there's the carbon mitigation initiative CMI there. Um, and it's a, it's a great group of people, and we've worked very closely with them uh, over the years. But uh, um, it, we were disappointed, of course. Um, but at the time, uh, we those of us who worked on that uh, effort had been talking about it to one of the, the advisory groups for the, the uh, School of Earth Sciences. I was the dean at the time. And um, one of the companies on the, the that that uh, group, uh, the member from that, uh, from Schlumberger said, you know, we'd, we'd be interested in what you're kind of talking about, but we don't want to do it by ourselves. Uh, we would like some other sponsors. And so uh, a few of us went to work, and, uh, uh, and in the end, to make a, a long story short, we were able to put together uh, a, a $200 million uh, project over a 10-year period to, to look at reducing greenhouse gas emissions from energy use. Um, and uh, that that led then to uh, one to having some resources that um, that we could put to work uh, to um, to build the energy the build the energy clean energy research program here at Stanford. There was lots of stuff going on uh, distributed all across the campus, uh, but it it was largely individual research groups uh, doing their own thing. Um, and what came out of that, um, we can talk a little bit about why and how that, but what came out of that was a group of people that did know each other, that were working together in lots of new ways, uh, and I think maybe the most, if there's any one thing you take away from this, the most important part of this was the, the relationships amongst students in the various research groups. Now, I'm going to reveal the secret to a good university. Information transfer particles in a university are graduate students and postdocs. It's not the faculty. The uh, faculty are too busy. They have uh, too many things to do. There are classes to teach, the, the proposals to write, and all the committees to serve on. It's, it's all of you. Um, and uh, the the what we put together with regard to the Global Climate and Energy Project, uh, we, were, we did proposal competitions. Um, and in those proposal competitions, we, did, we asked for three things. One was good science or engineering science. You know, that kind of goes without saying. The second one was an impact on greenhouse gas emissions. But it didn't have to be uh, overnight. And it could be a pathway to impact. It didn't have to be necessarily. So we're interested in in fundamentals, but, uh, but uh, as I say, uh, certainly in the early pre-commercial kind of side of it. And then the third thing we asked for was something that was step out. So what do we mean by that? Well, what we were, you know, you'll see research groups across the university that have been working in a particular area for a long time, and they've built a logical and incredibly important step-by-step -step attack on things. And that's very important. And it's an absolutely essential way that we do things. But at the same time, here we had a relatively modest amount of money, $20 million a year more or less, um, that we wanted to put into things that were not necessarily the next incremental step, but were something that was, was tougher, that we were willing to take some risk, we were willing to take the long view. Um, and the interesting thing about this was that the way research groups uh, went to work to try to satisfy the step out requirement was one of them was to band together with some research group that they hadn't worked on before to do some problem that they, neither group thought they could pull off on their own, but together they might have a shot. Well, so of course what that did was to get the students to get to know each other amongst these research groups. And, uh, and we funded some of the work, and we were way oversubscribed on, uh, on requests uh, for all this money. But, uh, but we provided lots of feedback from the review process. And in some cases, the research groups took the, the, that uh, knowledge of the reviews and 
came back to us or got it funded somewhere else or whatever. But the key part of it, I think the most important part of it was that they had such a good time brainstorming about all the stuff that they might be able to do that would be hard to support in the standard way of doing things, uh, that they kept right on doing it even, uh, even after we were, they were finished with us. Or um, uh, So what that did was to build a cross-link community of uh, researchers, faculty who knew each other, students who knew each other, uh, research groups looking for problems at their boundaries that, uh, that could be worked on. Um, and so, and one of the things that came out of that then was to do something like uh, the, what we're doing here, uh, which is to, to look for an opportunity to create those relationships amongst all of you uh, at, as early as we can just because we know that your paths will cross in interesting ways and that good things will flow from that. So, so uh, part of the reason you're all here is that uh, that we're hoping that uh, you'll, you'll get to know each other. Um, and I would say that, that a lesson I learned, too, uh, in Washington, amongst other things, is that, you know, for heaven's sakes, be polite. Um, you never know when your path will cross with somebody else uh, that, uh, that you met in some situation like this. Um, and my uh, existence proof for that is that uh, the, uh, the woman who's the head of the National Science Foundation, France Cordova, uh, she and I were undergraduates here uh, about a hundred years ago. So, uh, <laughs> so here we were, we found ourselves in Washington, you, you know, in charge of I don't know, eighteen billion dollars a year of federal research. Uh, the two of us, um, and it just was a little help that we already knew each other. So, so take advantage of those pathways when they uh, when they uh, arise as well, John. So uh, a couple of comments, just to put a little bit more of a scale on what was accomplished. I actually think of Lynn as being Herculean in responding to the 10 or 12 uh, labors of Hercules. Uh, I think his cousin Eurythius actually put those forward. There's actually a historical debate about whether it was 10 or 12. The, uh, the one I like, uh, speaking of fake news, even in uh, Greek mythology, is there were originally 10, and uh, Hercules violated the thing. So my image of Lynn is that way. But just to put a kind of frame on the magnitude of the effort, uh, there's also a debate about uh, how big this scale increase that Lynn described from, say, 2002 to 2010-ish when he was, or 2013, I should say, going through of the uh, Global Climate Energy Par uh, Project and the initiation of the Precourt Institute, I would say the number of faculty and who were spending significant amount of time on energy, energy research, students, uh, postdocs, uh, projects, and so on, went up by at least a factor of four. four. My personal estimate is a factor of eight. So this took us from you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 people who were working in various outposts around campus to this gigantic, partially, and with pre-court, even more integrated group of 200 plus, as you see in the, probably read this when you were thinking of apply here. That's actually true, but it wasn't always that way. And I think Lynn was, uh, among many important uh, people, the most important person in uh, making that so. Speaking of that kind of language, if you're a Star Trek fan, one uh, piece of dirt is the two of us are uh, two, probably there's a moderate amount of Stanford faculty or, who are um, Star Trek affectionados. So I'm thinking back to the press conference that announced GSAP in 2002. So I was minding my own business and as a Star Trek um, fan, uh, actually Lynn had run a bunch of faculty um, get-togethers before it was actually announced what GSEP was and who was involved. And I thought to myself, in the kind of quirky way I think about things, it would be nice to invent something like dilithium crystals or better. So I'm remembering going out to the posters, student posters that were available after the press conference, and Lynn came up to me. And he, has almost never said anything potentially confrontational or territorial to me. And he said, hey, are you the guy that's going around talking about uh, uh, Star Trek and Dive Through Crystals? And I said, yes, sir, Captain. And he said, uh, that's my idea. And I then learned uh, not only um, 
uh, about that, but that Lynn got to participate in a event at Monterey Bay Aquarium where they actually had the model for the Cleon bird of prey that went in uh, under under the the Golden Gate Bridge uh, uh, as part of that uh, uh, movie movie script. Uh, sorry for those of you who don't farther, fire, uh, follow Star Trek. So I'd like to turn that to, into a question. Uh, as is well known to your good friends, uh, since you've already won from the uh, uh, Starfleet Command, which represents the uh, uh, Intergalactic Federation of Planets, a, a several awards of valor, a Medal of Honor, Silver Palm with Cluster, and a Starfleet Citation for, get this, conspic Conspicuous Gallantry. I told you I was a Lynn fan. Uh, was one of your initial goals in starting GSAP to literally uh, invent a, either a substitute uh, for or a synthetic way to make dilithium crystals, given the politics intergalactically of that in the Star Trek theme, sir? Well, uh, I have to say that we didn't have anything quite as clear uh, a goal as that. But I will tell you a story about dilithium crystals. So, and actually, the truth is that my wife gets the credit for this. That we just we put all this effort into trying to to put together this project. It took basically a year of uh, of uh, traveling the world, negotiations, and so on. But we did this, and so the, my Christmas present from that uh, that year was a beautiful set of crystals. And in case uh, now, to the uneducated eye, these might have looked like uh, fluorite. Um, but obviously they weren't because it came on a little wooden stand that had a nice little brass plaque that said dilithium crystals. So, um, so this, this was great. The dilithium crystals, I will say, went with me to the Department of Energy and were on my coffee table. I had an office that was bigger than anybody should ever have. But uh, the, the, there was a couch and a, a coffee table and, uh, and place for it there. And it was kind of a test. Um, I think uh, when you're, if you're my age or John's age, we, we all remember the Star Trek uh, uh, movies and the, and the TV show, and sometimes the, the younger uh, 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 folks at DOE would come in and they'd go, Dil dilithium, what, di dil dilithium, never heard of this stuff, what is it? So, so anyhow, if, for those of you who don't know, it's the material that you, you use to contain the antimatter for the warp drive in that makes the starships go faster than the speed of light. So it's pretty important stuff. Um, <laughs> and at, and I had hardly been at DOE when there was this controversy uh, that ar arose, an email debate, because some DOE employees had been off at Comic-Con uh, doing, and they did on their own time this wonderful sort of energy educational thing that uh, uh, I, it was just so clever. I just loved it. Uh, in any case, the somebody somewhere in the bureaucracy raised the question of, was this an, an appropriate use of federal funds? Well, first of all, uh, there wasn't any use of federal funds, so it was entirely appropriate. But, uh, but uh, I was brand new at DOE, you know, so there's this, all this stuff flying around. Um, and I finally jumped in and I said, come on, folks, lighten up. You know, this, these, this was done on their time. It was great fun. It reached an audience that might, you know, we were, some education could do with it. Um, uh, I think we should uh, be applauding this. Um, and then I said, but of course I might be biased because I'm the guy with dilithium crystals in my office. <laughs> well, so, so in fact, that shut down the whole argument. So dilithium turned out to be, uh, to be useful there. So in terms of the goals that we had to, uh, in thinking about this, um, I don't think we ever set out to invite any one device, invent any one device. In fact, uh, if there was a, something that seemed pretty clear to us at the very beginning, it was that, that it, this, we needed a portfolio. That uh, there were, or if you look at all the ways we transform energy resources into some uh, energy service, there, the resources might be fossil, they might be uh, solar, they might be wind, they might be um, nuclear. There's a, there's a whole series of resources there. Um, and we use a variety of technologies to get those into the services like electricity and transportation and heating and cooling and lighting and so on. Um, so we wanted to look across the, that spectrum to ask where were there opportunities for university-based research 
to do some things that would be hard that, uh, that weren't necessarily being worked on in industry now. Um, so we did a whole series of workshops where we, we asked ourselves really the research agenda question. You know, if we were going to work in the solar area, you know, what kinds of things would we, we do? If we were going to uh, tackle the nuclear area, in the end, we chose not to do a lot on the nuclear side because we didn't think we had enough money to make an impact there. So, um, so we did a whole series of those and then it calls for proposals and really tried to, to use the opportunity we had to generate new ideas in the research community. Um, and that was both fun uh, and interesting. Uh, and then we made a lot of hard work for ourselves because we got all these cool proposals and that we had to, um, to try to figure out uh, uh, which of those uh, were the strongest and made the most sense for university-based uh, work. And uh, something like uh, about half that work was done at Stanford and about, well, maybe 40% was done at other universities around the world. So, so we did a bunch of traveling the world to, to try to drum up business. Uh, uh, John participated in a few of these. Uh, I can remember uh, a... Uh, a, uh, Richard. <laughs> Richard Sassoon's laughing in the back because the three, the bunch of us, we, we uh, well, there was that trip into India where uh, uh, our luggage got lost on the way, and we every day we were going to a new city in India, and the luggage chased us all the way around in <laughs> India. We finally got it the last day as we went back to so There was a lot of washing our underwear and using the hairdryer to, to, to get it done. Um, uh, and uh, so anyhow, we had, we had lots of good times in, uh, uh, trying to figure out how to do this. But it's not like we, we had it all figured out at the beginning. We, had to, we really did uh, make it up as we went along. Um, and in the process, the, 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 what I described of, of sort of building all the cross-linking here at the campus, um, that, that was in, in a way a byproduct. I don't think we had completely figured that out at the beginning. And I think that what that means for all of you is that, uh, that, it's, that it's not a prescribed way to do it. You know, we're looking for opportunities. And the, the, the really good thing about bringing a bunch of really smart people together um, and, and uh, empowering them to try to figure out how to invent the future is that, that you know, there's so much that we can do. The opportunity space has never been bigger. Uh, than it is now for uh, inventing a clean energy future. So, uh, I if if I had any one em emotion in meeting all of you, it would be envy. You know, you just it's such a great time. It's such an opportunity to change the world. And and by the way, we do need to change the world. So uh, so it's something that's really important. So we just need all the players we can get on the field. Actually, as much as I'd like to do a lot of anecdotes about Lynn and Richard and. Chris Edwards, Mr. Exergy, who you'll probably meet, and myself going to China and India, and China and India again, and Japan. I'd like to pick up on that theme explicitly, because another arc, I think, that um, you were instrumental in, back to the student perspective, is the evolution of the IP agreements and the role of the students working in the labs and early GSEP in revamping that. Yeah, so, um, so, the, the way all that worked for the Global Climate and Energy Project, you know, if, uh, uh, was that uh, everything that we did there was to be published, if it was good enough to be published. Uh, no, you, you might already know that uh, uh, we're not allowed to do anything at Stanford that's not, with graduate students, that's not uh, uh, to be published. Uh, uh, that's, we don't do any proprietary work for anybody. Um, and, um, and the, the companies that sponsored um, uh, uh, the GSEP, uh, I think mostly what they didn't want to have happen was for, um, for somebody to come along and patent some idea that we'd, uh, we'd worked on that then they would have to pay to use the patents that they'd supported the research for. So, they, so we worked out a sort of a non-exclusive um, license arrangement that any work that that made sense to patent would get pat patented, but would be available uh, broadly um, uh, after that. I think mostly, in, in, in most cases, it was not uh, 
a big impediment because the work was so early stage that uh, that by the time it gets to commercial uh, use, there would be a whole lot more follow-on work that uh, went that way. But we did make sure that uh, that all of that was uh, uh, publicly available. And I'll, I'll just use that as an opportunity to say that um, uh, the, the fundamentals, the material science, the, uh, all the, the ideas for new devices or systems, those are all really important. But if we're going to change the world, we have to get to scale. So, uh, so the business of uh, going beyond um, uh, what we do in the university and making sure that that translates to a world where, uh, where you can, uh, can get to market, that's, that's an important part of it. And in a way, John, that, that leads to the idea that uh, the Global Climate and Energy Project was, uh, it was a specific research project. It was interdisciplinary, um, uh, but it, so it wasn't owned by any one of the schools or departments. Um, uh, but, it, uh, but it was really focused on the technical side. But as, as uh, Arun um, uh, pointed out nicely in, uh, in the opening presentation, um, no matter how good we all are on the technical side, you still have to think about markets, you still have to think about financing, you still have to, uh, the regulatory uh, system works as well. So that led uh, to the eventual formation of the Precourt Institute for Energy, which is a, a deliberate attempt to provide a home for all the interdisciplinary work that uh, goes on across the campus. So. That, uh, and that broadened to include the, the, the uh, economists and, the, and, the, um, uh, and people really working across the spectrum of, of how you get to, uh, to transformations in a, a big, complicated, existing uh, energy system for the world. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, just to sync this up, I was going that direction um, anyway. So um, I think everybody who got this book that I helped edit, so we kind of talked about the the long arc of techno uh, energy technology innovation from deep laboratory to applied research to VCs to startups and so on. And I, I, I do think for me, the other observation regarding the IP is some of the students say, well, this is big, you know, kind of heavy metal, 50 year out targets. But we've learned enough in your lab, Professor Blank, fill in the blank, you'll see most of the people here um, subsequently, but we think we can get halfway there uh, right now uh, with the startup. So, uh, two questions about that. One, um, um, how many startups came? Richard may know this exact number out of the original GSEP clan. I actually know and have advised several of them, uh, and that includes not just tech people, but often systems and marketing people from the Stanford community who met when they were graduate students. And second, uh, just to lay out another uh, odd observation, I do think this jump from GSEP, which is mostly technical stuff, to the broader frame needed uh, now more than ever with the audience here being among the most critical uh, people uh, to do it was a little bit like uh, the labor of cleaning out the Aegean stables because there were a bunch of existing organizations, including at Slack and around campus, that you had to kind of move to together and get uh, moving in the right direction. So before we go to open questions, I'd like you to address that a little bit if you're willing to do so. Uh, sure, I can try. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so if you think back to the just the broader question of, uh, we'd really face this with uh, w with what led to the Woods Institute for the Environment that we had environmental researchers all the way across the campus, um, and we certainly had energy researchers, and you know there was a long series of gosh for years uh, uh, discussions about whether we should try to create a, a single entity and move all the faculty that. To, to that uh, entity to work on the environment? And the answer was that that was too hard, that um, uh, instead we've used the, the interdisciplinary institutes as a way to, to get the benefits of that cross-linking without disrupting the, all the, you know, the, the department admissions and the curricula and the educational programs. So, so we already had that model in place. Um, 
Uh, and then as we began to, to think about creating a, an energy institute, the question is, should we try to, um, to pull all those things or just in, in sort of hard organizational terms, or should we just do it informally? And that what we ended up with was some, something that was partly in the, minute, uh, in the middle. So we, uh, the, there was the Global Climate and Energy Project. There was the Precourt Energy Efficiency Center, which was working very hard on all the energy efficiency um, aspects. Um, and um, and uh, we pulled uh, those pieces. And then we built an executive committee with a whole of populated with a whole bunch of people that didn't actually report to me. Um, they were the heads of, uh, of other uh, uh, research groups uh, around the, the uh, university. Um, and we just kind of charged ahead and, and did it and didn't work too much, worry too much about the, uh, the, the specific organizational, um, uh, the way you drew the boxes on the page. And I guess since I've made a whole career of uh, ignoring institutional boundaries, um, and have appeared to get away with it, uh, I, I think that's a good thing to do. And I hope that one of the things that will come out of, of all your, your week here is that, that you just won't pay any attention to those, that, uh, that the, the having students from the biz school and the medical school and, the, and humanities and sciences and engineering and earth sciences and education and who did I leave out, law, um, uh, those you know that just gives us a way to to uh, to, to build some further uh, relationships that can lead to some good stuff. And on the company side, uh, I don't know, Richard. Do you have a number for how many startups came out of GSEP? Um, you know, a lot of startups they evolved from GSEP work, and so it so. They'll hear later during the week from the Tomcat Center, and they'll hear about all those startups. But there's an evolution that goes into a technology startup. And, and so I would say you know, a dozen or a couple of dozen probably had their origins yeah. in GSEP, yeah, yeah. whether they, they might not necessarily be directly emanating from a, a specific technology that came out of GSEP, but it may be the students that then went on to develop something uh, after that time, yeah, I, I I agree with that. A couple of dozen seems seems uh, uh, reasonable. I don't know. One of my one of my students started a company that clearly came out of the, the stuff that we did with uh, GSAP support. So, um, so that for those of you that have an entrepreneurial bent, that uh, there is that possibility as well. I would say having worked uh, helping Jim Sweeney with Record Energy Efficiency Center, this phenomenon Lynn um, mentioned. I uh, see Diane. Diana Kinnapa, who was one of our postdocs, it, uh, that kind of gave us a, uh, an opportunity in our own group. We were both in management science and engineering, but Jim was able to get kind of pure behavioralists like cognitive psychologists together with tech people who did sensors, controls, and so on uh, in uh, search of what's been called in the VC community digital demand technologies, which were even in Clean Tech 1.0 became some of the successful ones. So these were essentially IT apps in energy. I'm not clear without this environment that Lynn had uh, created here, we could have been, done that. So we're working you know, hand in hand. I remember a key um, workshop Kerry Armel put together where there was a day with the behavioralist, no technology mentioned, a day with the technologists, no human interventions mentioned. And then she had strong contacts with the IDO folks who are the kind of genesis of the uh, D school. And they could work with us in the usual IDO manner with tables and uh, jelly beans to get everybody hyped up on sugar, which actually works, by the way, to make this kind of progress. That's one, just one example, but I think what Lynn described went on all across campus. So you had materials guys and uh, gals and um, um, working across ME and material science and bioengineering and so on. You still see that considering, uh, continuing. And I do think this evolution towards shorter run focus and shorter term has led to shorter term research, which has got these very disparate communities trying to work together to move the needle. Apropos of the last question that was asked to Rob Jackson to get uh, moving further faster. So I see we have our 10 minute warning, so I feel we ought to open it up to audience questions at this point. 
everybody's still awake and nobody's left for a lunch yet, so good job. <laughs> well, well, I would say that uh, in terms of, uh, you, you mentioned jelly beans, that uh, um, uh, just as uh, graduate students and postdocs are the information transfer particles, you need, for the energetics of that, you need fuel. And the, the fuels are uh, caffeine, uh, pizza, sugar, I mean, pretty much all the major food groups, um, and, uh, uh, and then uh, maybe a beer or a glass of wine. So I told you Lynn was smart, and he really plays to the graduate school audience. So great transition. Uh, so questions? Um, okay, over here. Hi, I have a question for Lynn. What, um, how different is the current administration from the previous administration when it comes to energy policy? Uh, you mean the federal uh, administration? Yeah, right? Donald Trump and Obama. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. If you uh, so you can think about inverse uh, functions. You know, uh, that's uh, yeah. The, certainly, the attitude is different. Uh, it was. Uh, I have to say, it was great fun working at DOE. The, the Secretary of Energy was uh, Ernie Moniz, who. He had had the job at MIT that I had here that is running the interdisciplinary research, uh, energy research program. Um, and, uh, and I, um, and of course I was brought in specifically to, uh, to try to figure out ways to, to build links uh, amongst the, uh, the fundamental science and the applied energy programs. Um, and there was a big commitment to work, on, uh, to work on climate change, to work on clean energy and that sort of thing. Um, and that's what we did. Um, the Paris Agreement was done on our watch, and we, um, uh, the, you know, as soon as I came back from Paris, we, we put together a team and did a five-year energy uh, R&D plan for, uh, for uh, a doubling of energy research at, um, at uh, in the United States at least. So, uh, so the attitude is, uh, as you've seen, quite different. In uh, there's a there's a pretty strong anti-regulatory. Uh, stance in the current administration, and uh, they've been busy trying to undo uh, a bunch of the things that we worked on. Um, that's a, the thing to remember here, of course, is that the, 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 the White House does not control the entire universe. The Congress matters, too. Um, they, for example, have the, the administration budgets have been uh, for sharp reductions in the applied energy research, but the Congress has not gone along. And, uh, and those budgets have actually stayed okay. So, so yeah, there's a big, there's certainly a big strong contrast in emphasis uh, amongst those two administrations. Actually, let me put in an unsolicited plug for the energy seminar, which Precourt uh, has me coordinating. Our very first speaker, two weeks from today, 4:30 in Video Auditorium, is Kevin DeLeon, who was the master meister of uh, what's called SB 100, the latest California regulatory approach, which is, uh, I think, 100% renewable gen in California by 2045, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, so I just, let me say one, whether, uh, one more thing uh, about this, and that is that, um, you know, I, uh, energy R&D is pretty important, but the a whole, most of the energy regulation in this country is done at the state level. Um, so um, the, feds, the feds have a few um, things that are important. Um, uh, energy efficiency standards, cafe standards for the